Welcome to the final 2012 in perspective before the election, where we'll go past the headlines and take a deeper look at the issues. We're joined today by Dave Brady, Deputy Director of the Hoover Institution and Professor of Political Science at Stanford's Graduate School of Business, as well as the School of Humanities and Science. Tammy Frisbee is a Hoover Institution Research Fellow who also teaches political science at Stanford University, and Andrew Reeves, a Hoover National Fellow and University Professor of Political Science at Boston University. Welcome, everyone. At this point, it seems that our October surprise in this election is Hurricane Sandy. Andrew, how has this natural disaster affected the campaigns? Uh, I, it's affected it in a, a, a fairly substantial way. I mean, I think uh, both uh, the president and Governor Romney have had to uh, suspend their campaigns to some degree, and President Obama has had to uh, take off his campaigner in chief hat and put on his his uh, president hat, and instead of watching uh, the news media talk about uh, the barbs back and forth between the campaigns, we're seeing images of the president uh, hanging out with New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, comforting voters and uh, talking about uh, the aftermath of Sandy. So who does this help the most? Well, uh, I think it helps President Obama. Um, and I, I have a, 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 a paper that uh, my colleague John Gasper and I published in the American Journal of Political Science where um, we looked at election time uh, natural disasters. We looked at county level election returns since about the 1970s. And we found that um, voters had two fairly strong reactions. On one hand, they uh, blamed incumbents for the damage that natural disasters caused. Uh, but on the other hand, they rewarded them when they took action to try to mitigate those disasters. So in cases where the politicians, we looked at presidents and governors, where they weren't responsive, uh, they, they tended to get blamed. Whereas if they took action uh, and provided a federal response, then we found that they, they tended to get rewarded. So, you know, Sandy is unlike your typical natural disaster in that it's a national story. It's not a local story. But I think, uh, you know, my research and the research of others suggests that there's some electoral benefit that President Obama uh, will get, and probably more so because it's a national story as opposed to a local story, which is the case with a lot of these, uh, most of these natural disaster events. Andrew, I actually have a question for you. Um, is it the case that the president has to provide dollars, direct relief payments, or is he able to get these sorts of benefits, electoral benefits, even without those monetary payments? Because I would imagine with the timing of this disaster, if it, this was entirely dependent upon those checks that people are receiving, I mean, those aren't going out quite yet, I would suppose, and so that could affect things. Or can, can they do this through other mechanisms? Yeah, I, I think there's several potential mechanisms. I think, as you suggest, Tammy, one of the mechanisms is, you know, the president, in some cases, literally handing out checks uh, uh, to voters. Um, but on the other hand, you have these images of President Obama, who I think has been criticized as being someone who sort of one on one can be a little bit aloof. You know, he's he's providing comfort to voters and really showing off his leadership skills. And these images are being picked up by local media, by national media. And that's what's on the news when we go to watch. So I think there's um, there's many mechanisms involved. And I think there's a potential for the president to get a bump from this, even though most of the, the, the affected people aren't going to be seeing checks from, from FEMA or the federal government before Election Day. Well, what, this hey. day, Brady, what, what is the, uh, I, the bump is, uh, can't be much more than a point, a point and a half. I've, uh, I've been tracking it and uh, with YouGov Polymetrics, looks like a point, something like that. Is that what you mean by a bump too? You're not looking for three or four percent, right? That's right. That's right. And in, and in, and in my study, again, where you know Sandy is a, a unique event in that it's so uh, it's such a massive event taking place so close to an election. Um, you know, we were looking at much smaller events, and our estimate on the county level for for the president was even a little less than a point. So right. the, the magnitude of the bump, I think you're exactly right. Uh, we'll we'll uh, wait and see, but I don't I don't think it's going to hurt the president. 
Dave, we saw that Governor Romney suspended his campaign. He turned some uh, you know, rallies into opportunities for people to donate and volunteer. It, can Romney do anything else? Or is, is he on the right course? Did he handle this correctly? Yeah, I don't see uh, what else he could do. He can't. He can't go on campaign. He can't. Uh, can't really criticize the president because the press is covering the president favorably. He's doing presidential things, so I, I don't see uh, what else he could do except in the back room say, "My God, the president's lucky." If you you've been following this so closely with so much of your polling and your numbers, if if Obama wins this, is this because the election turned on a national disaster? Uh, I don't. I agree with what Andrew uh, said. I don't think it hurts him. Uh, point or so. Uh, what what we had was um, my view all along has been that independents are going to decide this race. Given the breakdown of party identification in the U.S., it meant that Romney had to have about sixty percent of independents to win. And he's close. He's at 53, 54, 55. And uh, so the question is, what's happening to those independents and how are they uh, viewing this? Uh, But they're about the only ones that can turn. So I take it that Andrew's uh, point bump is probably coming from them, but I don't have data on that yet. Well, let's turn to another important issue of the election, which will happen tomorrow. It'll be the last round of job numbers uh, to be released. I know none of us uh, here are economists. However, let's look at this from a political science point of view. Tammy, how will those job numbers get played out by the campaigns? Well, I expect the campaigns will play them out much as they did a month ago. These jobs numbers are expected to be as good or a little bit better than the ones that we saw last month. Uh, ADP has their estimate out today saying that we could see job growth as high as 158,000. That would be an improvement on last month. Um, Layoffs appear to be up a little bit, uh, but I think on balance, the jobs numbers will be fairly Um, good for the president. And so we'll continue to have the president say that we are moving in the right direction. There's more work to do, but he's gotten the economy moving again. And the Romney campaign will continue to say that this is essentially more of the same. It's not enough and that we aren't experiencing the kind of job growth we need to get us out of the hole that the financial crisis put us in. So again, really where we were, were a month ago with the jobs numbers is where we will be tomorrow. Andrew, will this bump be enough? Will this final outcome uh, matter? I'm, I'm sorry, with respect to the jobs numbers? Jobs, yeah. Even, we know that if it's a little more, a little less, it's not going to be too much either way. So whatever this number is, will it affect the outcome? I mean, even when, they're, when the numbers are uh, you know, relatively large, these things tend to get digested and, and projected through partisan lenses. So... You know, if it's if it's a small number or, um, you know, I I think it'll it'll end up just sort of solidifying the views that uh, most people already have. Um, And whether that news even reaches the independent voters, it's it's hard to say. I don't know that they're going to be especially attuned uh, to a, a, a jobs report, especially in light of you know, what, what's being focused on in the, the news cycle and will probably continue to be for the next, you know, 48, 72 hours is, is the fallout from the storm. Dave, again, you've been tracking these, these uh, voters all along. What is your data showing you on who is, uh, what, which side, Republicans or Democrats, are more affected by the economy and are voting based on the economy? Uh, it's interesting. The Republicans. So when you poll and ask, how's the economy doing? Uh, Republicans. So you poll Republicans think it's not doing very well. Democrats think it's doing much better. And independents are actually closer to the. Uh, they're they're closer. They're in between the two, but they're a little closer to the Democrats. They think it's improving. That benefits uh, the president, but. Still, they are uh, going for Romney because they think it could be better. But again, they're not going 60 percent for Romney. Well, Aaron, if I could add one last thing here about the jobs numbers, and that is that in this cottage industry that we have in political science about election forecasting, one of the what I find to be interesting things we see when you look at all these models together is that we do just as good a job predicting election outcomes using April economic data as we do using November economic data. So on that point alone, 
the jobs numbers are going to come out tomorrow. I think Andrew's right. Most people won't even know that happened. They're paying attention to their own personal economic situation. And, and that, that to me is what probably explains the ability to use spring data to tell us what's going to happen on election day. Well, clearly the economy is one of the most important issues weighing on people's minds. So it will be interesting to see what that outcome is on election day. And turning to the international front, the campaign's point counterpoint about the attack on the embassy in Benghazi continues. Andrew, will the outcome on Tuesday be affected by this international event? No, I, I don't think it will. And you know, you saw Romney try to uh, make hay of the this issue in the debate, and uh, you know, it devolved into this discussion of uh, you know the, the fact checking that went on because you know Romney was trying to make a broader point about the response of the White House. And it devolved into, you know, whether the president made this point about using the word terrorism or not. So, you know, it, it, sort of more broadly speaking, the issue went nowhere in terms of media coverage and in terms of, of its discussion in the debate. And also, I don't think uh, foreign policy is on the minds of most Americans right now. They care about the economy. And, um, you know, it's probably... Uh, most beneficial for Romney to talk about the economy. And uh, Obama probably doesn't want to spend too much time talking about uh, Libya either. So I don't think that the, I think it's been a, a, a non-issue in the press and the, the uh, candidates uh, aren't talking about it. And I don't think voters care about it all that much. So, Aaron, I, I agree with that. But and, and so for me, the point is that um, you have to think about what what's going on in the average voter's mind. They're they're not so on TV and in the chattering classes. It's uh, people who are very, they understand. Gee, what did the president say when he said it? And did he say this Libyan act was a terrorist act versus the other? When you when you're into a complicated issue like that, the average voter is not deciding on the nuances of policy. What the average voter is deciding is how things go economically and foreign policy. The president's got a lead on foreign policy, and the reason is we haven't been attacked. Uh, there may be losses in our power that sophisticated people know, but those are hard issues to get across to the public. And far as they're concerned, the pres no terrorist attacks under his regime. Things are fine. So that's just not an issue that's going to do it. It's the economy. So here you have an issue. It's an international issue. People don't care about it as much as they do, you know, domestic in their own backyard. You have an issue that's complicated and nuanced. And on top of that, you have an issue that's really not been covered by the media much. Some would say if this had been reversed and this had been under a Bush administration, there'd be a lot more scrutiny uh, paid to the president for, you know, what happened and when. Tammy, do you agree with that? I don't think that we have any good data right now to say that uh, that's the case, that if you could find a comparable incident during the Bush administration, that we would think that the media went after Bush harder than they're going after Obama right now. I think when you think about the range of issues that the American media is being expected to cover right now during this campaign, my impression is that Libya is getting fairly decent coverage. But back to, to David's point, this is a very complicated issue. This is not... Uh, Iranian hostages, American citizens being held as Iranian hostages during the Carter administration. People don't know what's going on with this issue. And trying to sort it out in the press, uh, I think the American people just really uh, don't, don't have the time or the inclination to follow that. Great points. Another, I think, surprise of this election has been the debates. At least the first one was very exciting. Dave, did, did, the, did the debates matter? They certainly did. Um, the Just before that first debate, uh, Mitt Romney's big advantage all along was on the economy. And by the just before that first debate, the polls had shown that not only had Obama drawn even with him on it, he'd drawn a little bit ahead. So uh, the first debate was exceedingly important. He focused on uh, he focused on the economy, he focused on jobs. And uh, there was some movement toward him, it tightened the polls up, changed the race, made the president run harder, work harder, spend more money. And most importantly, the jobs issue after that first debate went once again back in favor of Romney. And that's the issue that he's winning the middle, that he's winning the uh, uh, independent voters with. And that's and that's the sort of in one sense from the Romney perspective, that's the tragedy, the double tragedy for him of uh, Sandy, because he can't talk about the economy now in the way that he wants to for the last few days. Tammy, what was your take on the debates? 
Well, when you think about the question whether the debates matter, there are a few different benchmarks you can set for yourself. And one of them would be, is the person who wins on election day not the person that we would have predicted in advance was going to win? And you know, right now, the models based on the economy and international factors are showing a very tight race, but one that on average, when you aggregate these together and try to do type of meta analysis, show the president being reelected, say, by 50 point, with 50.3 percent of the vote. Uh, so if the president wins, did the debates matter? Well, one answer would be no. As David was talking about, it certainly changed the, the trajectory of the campaigns and how this race has played out. But if you want to say, well, you know, we got a different outcome, I don't think you can really say that. And when you look back at the historical data on the debates, if you look at the poll of polls, the averages in polling in the week prior to the first debate in an election cycle and the week after, it's hard to make a good case using that data that debates are changing the eventual outcome. That if you look at the percentage of the vote that the incumbent party in the polling is getting before and after, there's only one election in the last five presidential election cycles where we can make a decent case that the debates matter. And that would have been in 2000, where uh, Al Gore comes out of that cycle of three debates, about three and a half points down from where he was going in. And of course, that's an election, at least in Florida, that I uh, you know, would have been um, decided differently if, you know, if he hadn't had that loss. That's that's a pretty hard criteria that the guy going in on the models uh, has to lose the election for the debate to make a difference. Suppose I'm up. Uh, suppose I should win with 52 and I win with uh, 49.6. That 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 surely makes a difference. And and the models where you got that 50.3 average, the ones that are just based on the economy, the fair model and the Hibbs model, both those say that uh, Romney should win. So uh, I'm. I'm uh, going to give it more importance than Tammy does. That that strikes me as a pretty hard zero one criteria. <laughs> All right, Andrew, you can be the tiebreaker. <laughs> well, I'm going to come. I'm going to split the difference. I'm going <laughs> to split the difference. They're both my esteemed colleagues are both both correct. I think. Um, you know the the before the debates, I think Romney. It was easy to caricature Romney based on some of the coverage of, of some of his gaffes that he had made. Um, and so you had that sort of personal factor there, uh, combined with the uncertainty and the fear that so many voters, and especially independents, had uh, have about the economy. And seeing Romney you know, debate and uh, come off as a, 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 a well-spoken, intelligent, thoughtful politician I think definitely helped to narrow that gap, and um, you know, like Tammy said, uh, will the will most of the forecasting models still still work out? Probably, uh, I you know, I think the, the 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 underlying current there of an Obama victory will still potentially uh, hold up. But like Dave said, that doesn't mean that the debates didn't move things in a significant and appreciable way, and and change the the you know, the weeks leading up to the campaign. Boy, you did split the difference. That was, that was amazing. Nice done, Andrew. Well, nice and I, work. I will concede <laughs> that that first debate certainly brought a halt to the rolling calamity, as Peggy Newton called it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in that way, yes. But I, I guess I'm a, I'm a harsh mistress, and uh, I want to put out the, the hardest to, to pass test. Well, let's take a step back and look at the big picture. Tammy, what's something about uh, out there in the commentariat about this election that you think makes a lot of sense? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard question. That is a hard question. <laughs> um, but it, an important one to think about. I'm, I'm glad you asked that, Erin, because you know, we try to think about what we do as social scientists is – we would like to think in dialogue with what's going on out there and an opportunity to maybe correct some, some things um, or, or support some things. So, and so the question is what, what's right or what's wrong? What do you think makes a lot of sense? Makes a lot of sense. Okay. I think it makes a lot of sense that uh, women are going to play an important part in deciding this election. I think there's a lot out there that doesn't make sense about exactly how that's going to happen. Uh, but we have been tracking the fact that there is this gender gap at the at 
the very least among um, single unmarried women, um, also these women tend to have lower incomes. And so the question is, you know, among those who are actually independents, not just Democrats, how are they going to swing? And that's something that we're going to have to wait until we have some election data, some, some vote data in order to really get at and then to see how that gender gap might have existed or not existed in other segments ac across women. Uh, so I think that throughout the times in this campaign where it's been about the war on women or this is an election that's going to be decided you know, by women, it's, of course, hyperbole. But to me, that is a, a big story in this election season. Well, and then on the flip side of that coin, Andrew, what's something out there in the commentary that you think doesn't make sense? Well, you know, I think there's a lot of hostility, especially among the punditocracy towards um, the people like Nate Silver and uh, things that get posted on the monkey cage, uh, which is a political science blog um, that rely on data to make forecasts. Um, it's sort of being summarily dismissed because people like Nate Silver and others sort of speak in probabilistic terms, right? So they say that his model predicts a 75% chance that Obama's going to win, and people just freak out about that because they take that to mean that Obama's going to get 75% of the vote, and it's just not the case. So I wish there was better engagement between uh, the people that talk the very most on news programs and some of the, the people that work with data and do the analysis and try to think carefully about modeling these sorts of things. And I'm a little dismayed at the, the disjoint that seems to be occurring between uh, the two groups. So I, 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 I see that is something that should be a productive relationship as opposed to uh, uh, this antagonistic relationship between those that understand numbers and those that are enumerate. Well, and that's what our show's for, so thank you very much. <laughs> oh, enough with this probability, Andrew. Just tell me who's going to win with 100% certainty. Well, we're almost there, but before we get to the uh, prediction, predictions of the day, Dave, Brady, once we have this election data, what's the question that you're most excited to start researching? Well, for me, the question has uh, always been what um, the what, what is indep there, there's been a huge rise in the number of independents, and many polls show more independents than Republicans or Democrats. Uh, that's complicated by the fact that some independents lean Democrat, some lean Republican, and some are true independents, uh, stay independent from election to election. So I'm interested in tracking the pattern of change uh, from the 50s uh, through the Reagan period when the Republicans gained and independents rose and Democrats lost, and uh, over the period from 2004 to 2013, we're going to have a sample of the same people, uh, a large sample of them from the YouGov Polymetrics poll, and we're going to see exactly where people are moving across this party ID uh, dimension through independence and what uh, the effect of that's going to be on uh, what the effect of that was on how they voted. Well, I can't wait to see that research. And I think it's now time to get into our uh, magic ball and see what some answers are going to be. Tammy, I'll put you, you on the spot first, and then I'm going to ask the same question of everyone else. Who wins the White House and why? And I just want to be clear, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm just shaking my magic eight ball. But <laughs> I, I think that uh, the president will be reelected, and um, my forecast – hinges on uh, Ohio. Um, Romney must win Florida in order to be able to get to 270 votes or even to get to 269. I know this, there's this scenario out there about 269 to 269 and going to the House of Representatives. But I think he has a better than um, average chance of picking up Florida. But I think Ohio is going to be the problem. And to me, that's a very interesting state to follow because it's American federalism in action where you have a Republican governor but he cannot fully get on board with the messaging from the National Party candidate about how bad the economy is in Ohio because the economy in Ohio is uh, better than in the rest of the country, has a uh, lower unemployment rate than the national average. And Governor Kasich wants to take some credit for that. And so that, combined with some other factors, I think uh, make it uh, – very difficult for the governor, Governor Romney, to win Ohio. And if he doesn't win Ohio, he has to pick up six other battleground states. He has to clean the board with uh, Nevada and Colorado, 
Iowa, New Hampshire, North Carolina, and Virginia. And if Ohio is not going for Romney, I have a hard time believing that those other six states are all going to fall his way and that the president um, can't just block in with a, a state or two. Dave, anything more optimistic from you? Well, I think probably the president wins the uh, the electoral college uh, between 280 and 300. I don't. Uh, I wouldn't make a prediction on the national uh, national vote. I think the the irony of it is that states like Ohio and Pennsylvania, uh, where fracking has uh, caused uh, been been the been the cause for uh, job increases. Um, where the president has not exactly been in favor of that. I, I think it's interesting that he's going to get credit for that, but that's the complexity of American elections. So it's going to be going to be close. Could still change, but the combination of jobs in the key states like Ohio, Pennsylvania, plus uh, the jobs report, plus the Sandy, I think all of those things lead me, and this is a prediction based on, put a gun to my head uh, or my wife and daughters are shot, uh, then I'd say Obama, 280, 300, but it's very, very close. And Andrew? Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is such a fascinating election because, um, you know, voters are faced with a national economy in some pla- in some contexts where the, the national economy is much worse than their state or local economy. They're judged with making decisions about, you know, is it is it uh, I'm better off than I'm, I was four years ago or I'm better off than I was uh, two years ago or four weeks ago. Um, and so, you know, th- there's so many different moving parts to this election. But I, I agree with what uh, both Tammy and Dave said. First of all, that, that Ohio is really the, the, the battleground of battlegrounds, right? The, the big enchilada, I think Tim Russert might have called Florida back in 2000. Um, Ohio is it this time around. And uh, Obama consistently seems to be up by a really small margin, but consistently seems to be up in every poll that's taken. And given that, it's hard to uh, uh, figure out how Romney can can pull it off. So I, I'm going to say there's a, uh, a probability of 0.75 uh, that Obama wins the, the, uh, the election. How about that? <laughs> I, yeah, there's only one thing I'd say, you know, I, enchilada might work some places, but I think in uh, Ohio, you should call it the big kibasa. <laughs> 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 yeah, or hot well, dish. Yeah, that's true. Hot dip, hot wings. Yeah. <laughs> it's exciting to focus on the presidential because it is the White House, but of also immense importance is the congressional races. Dave Brady, give us your assessment of the House and Senate races. That's easy. Uh, Republicans hold the House. They lose uh, maybe between zero and 10 seats. Uh, given, I think it's more like five or six, but given that they picked up over 60 to lose only five or six is pretty pretty miraculous. Uh, The Senate side, there have been just enough uh, Republican candidates uh, like in Indiana and uh, and uh, Missouri to make statements that the Republicans, which uh, everybody nine months ago predicted would take the Senate. I don't think they take the Senate. I think the Senate's 50 51 Democrat. Yeah. And actually, if I can can share here some uh, polling data that we have, a data set that I got this morning about the Murdoch comment. Uh, This is part of a larger project that David Brady and Mo Furina and Doug Rivers and I are engaged in where we're looking at campaign awareness among the American public. We've been asking questions since March. Every week we ask about a campaign event and we basically quiz Americans about what happened and they have to choose the, the right answer from a selection of three or the option that they haven't had a chance to hear about that. And when we we asked them about uh, the Murdoch comment. Fifty-seven uh, percent of our total respondents had heard about what Murdoch had said. Were able to correctly identify his statements about um, abortion and rape. So that is uh, fairly high for us, and not as high as our highest. Uh, awareness levels, which we got on the president's gay marriage announcement earlier this year, and then on um, Romney's uh, 47% speech. Overall, 73% of Americans and actually 83% of independents had heard about that. Uh, And then the Murdoch statement um, is, when I look quickly at the crosstabs, because these just came in, we continue to see this pattern um, that we've been um, kind of amazed at throughout the course of this election, and that is there, there's a gender gap even on these women's issue 
type of um, type of campaign events. And 62 percent of male respondents had heard about Murdoch's comments. In, uh, the, again, this is an Indiana Senate candidate and 52 percent, so 10 point gap with men having greater awareness of this event. So uh, thinking back to my interest in how you know, women will or will not play a role in this election, you know, people I think are in the commentariat are going to be quick to point back to these comments by Senate candidates, how this may have rolled over onto Romney. But one thing we should all keep in mind is that we're actually consistently seeing higher awareness levels about these comments among men than among women. Very interesting. Well, I think that's about does it. We are running out of time for our final 2012 in perspective before the election. But I know there will be lots to talk about with a new presidential term and a new Congress in 2013. And I look forward to talking to everyone then. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.